We're asked to evaluate the integral, and you're probably completing this within the context of partial fractions. So the first thing you want to do with partial fractions is just make sure that the degree of your numerator is smaller than the degree of the denominator. And so 2 is definitely smaller than 3, so we are okay there. If the degree of the numerator was either equal to or greater than the degree of the denominator, then you'd have to go through polynomial long division. We don't have to do that here. The next thing you want to do is take the expression that you're trying to integrate and you want to factor the denominator. So in the denominator, we can pull out a GCF of x. This leaves us with x squared minus 1. And then you want to factor your denominator further if possible. And in this case, we can do that because x squared minus 1 is the difference of perfect squares. So that factors as x minus 1 times x plus 1. Now look at your denominator carefully and you have three factors and all of them involve x raised to the power of 1. And therefore you have linear factors. Furthermore, they're all different. You have x, which is different from x minus 1, which is different from x plus 1. You have yourself distinct linear factors. And when you have distinct linear factors, it's the easiest case. You're going to basically take these constants a, b, and c and put them over the distinct linear factors. So in other words, you'll have a over your first linear factor plus b over your next linear factor plus c over your third linear factor. So that would be the setup. And then what you need to do is find a common denominator. So why don't we do this? It's going to get a little bit messy unless we magnify it. So we'll paste it down below and we'll make this a little bit bigger. So now the first denominator is going to need an x minus 1 as well as an x plus 1. Make sure you do that in the numerator as well, like so. The second denominator is going to need an x plus 1 as well as an x. So we'll give this an x and an x plus 1. And then the third denominator is going to need the x as well as the x minus 1. So multiply this by x and x minus 1. Once you notice you have a common denominator, everybody has this denominator in common, you can actually eliminate all of them. You're basically multiplying each term by the common denominator and they all cancel out. So in other words, you're left with the numerators. So you'll have 5x squared plus 2x minus 5 equals a times x minus 1 times x plus 1 plus bx times x plus 1 plus cx times x minus 1. Now, in this case, the easiest way to proceed is to let x equal 0. Now, we do that because if we plug 0 in here and here, this term and that term will cancel out because you're going to have b times 0, which is 0, and then that multiplies by x plus 1, and that still is 0. Same thing with the third term. So, in essence, you're going to plug 0 in for x. Now, you'll have 5 times 0 squared plus 2 times 0 minus 5 equals a times 0 minus 1 times 0 plus 1. The left side simplifies to negative 5. On the right, you have a times negative 1 times positive 1. So now you have negative 5 is equal to negative a. Therefore, a must equal 5. So we have found one of the three constants. Next, we can let x equal negative 1. We will see why that's a convenient choice. When you plug negative 1 in for the x's. I mean, you're going to plug them in for all the x's, but just notice these two positions very carefully. Negative 1 plus 1 is 0, so this whole term would 0 out, and this whole term would 0 out as well. So now we're going to go through and put in negative 1. We'll have 5 times negative 1 squared plus 2 times negative 1 minus 5 equals, over here you're going to have c times negative 1 times negative 1 minus 1. If we clean this up, we're going to have 5 minus 2 minus 5 equals negative c times negative 2. We end up here with negative 2 equals, now be careful here, this will become positive 2c, therefore c will equal negative 1. So now we just have to find b, and to find b, whoops, we're going to, let's see, why don't we let x equal positive 1. So putting positive 1 into this position as well into this position, you'll have 1 minus 1 for both of those. Those will zero out. So now we'll put 1 in for x. Why don't we just do it over here? We'll have 5 
times one squared plus two times one minus five equals b times one, and then times one plus one. So clean this up a little bit, five plus two minus five equals, this will become two b over here. So now you have seven minus five, you have two equals two b, and therefore b is equal to one. So you have your a, your b, and your c. So you can go back to your original partial fractions setup, whose goal was to find a, b, and c, and we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna plug it in. So for a, we'll put in the five. For b, we will put in the positive one that we found. And then for c, it's a negative one. So you can actually change this to a minus sign right there instead of a plus sign and then put a one there. Now recall that our goal was to integrate this expression with respect to x. So really, we're just trying to integrate these three partial fractions, and then that's gonna give us our answer. Now we perhaps can evaluate each one independently. So the first one is going to be five times the integral of one over x dx. The second one is going to be the integral of one over x minus one dx. And then the third one is minus the integral of one over x plus one dx. These are pretty easy. The first one becomes five ln absolute value of x. The second one becomes ln absolute value of x minus one, and then minus ln absolute value of x plus one. And then don't forget your constant of integration. And this would be your answer right here. Notice we did take a shortcut when evaluating these two integrals right here. Basically, for future reference, when you have the integral of one over a constant, excuse me, when you have one over a variable plus a constant, that always integrates to the natural log of the absolute value of x plus your constant. So that's just a good rule of thumb to keep in mind.